Hello all and welcome to the fifth Funk Prog Sweden. We're so happy that this time we are live from a TV studio actually in Stockholm. So we don't have any audience, we just have the speakers and some studio people here. So welcome all on the YouTube. So the agenda today, I'll do a short intro, that's what we're doing now. And then we'll do a presentation on closure by Closure in a Nutshell by James Trunk. And then we do a second presentation, Polylith, the last architecture you will ever need by Joachim and Furkin. And then last guy up is Emil. He's going to talk a little bit about Rust and what Rust borrowed from Functional. Yes, so why did I start this community? Funk Prog Sweden, because we love functional programming. We're open and inclusive. We want to spread functional, so everyone will do functional programming in the end. We also like to share, hence we are here and hence we're streaming to you over YouTube. So let's have fun and spread functional programming. And speakers and sponsors. If you have anything to present around functional, it doesn't need to be in a functional language. We had one Harald from the C++ community coming over and, and talking about C++ and how what it does in functional programming, so please come. Also, if you have a venue you could share once the corona madness is over, please come to us. Um, so just contact me and reach out to me, Magnus, or the other organizers, Tien and Matthias. And last but not least, how to to, to today as we live stream. Please ask any questions in the YouTube chat that you have and we'll send it over to the presenters. So let's start. So I will introduce Closure in a Nutshell by James Trunk. Welcome. Thank you very much, Magnus. You're warm, welcome. I'll take that from you. Yep. Let's see if the technology works. Hi everyone, hopefully you can see the slides now. Uh, my name is James and I'm here to give you a brief introduction to Clojure. And uh, we're going to start by exploring Clojure uh, through the lens of the design philosophy that is behind the language. And that's because I found that understanding why something is the way it is often gives a lot more value than just understanding uh, what it is or how that it works. And then once we've done a little bit of that uh, philosophical discussion, we'll finish with a little bit of live coding. I'm a bit nervous about that, but we'll see how it goes. And uh, the idea there is to put uh, some of the theory that hopefully you, you've been learning into practice and give you a little bit of an impression of what it feels like to create solutions with closure. Okay, so let's dive in. So design is separating into things that can be composed. Uh, Rich Hickey, he's the creator of Clojure, and I, I think this quote is perhaps the perfect place for us to start in our journey of trying to understand uh, Rich and how he thinks, and especially his creation. And what I think this quote tells us is that Rich really values separating ideas uh, that should be untangled, but giving us tools that allow us to combine them back together into simple solutions. So let's have a look at how he puts that into practice. And the first idea we're going to cover that Clojure has as a base philosophy is that it separates data from functionality. It does this by elevating data to a first-class citizenship within the language. Uh, and it encourages you to build your solutions using pure functions that work on that data. You could say, in a way, that Clojure is the antithesis or the opposite of object-oriented programming where the fundamental idea there is to tangle up those two concepts of data and functionality into objects, whereas Clojure wants to split those apart. But why is that? When you combine two pieces of data, you get data. When you combine two machines, you get trouble. If you only remember one thing from my talk, I really want it to be this quote. Uh, write it down, take a screenshot, ask Siri to take a note for you, uh, and then promise me that you're going to come back later and reread this and just give it a couple of minutes to ruminate on it, to ponder it, and think about why Rich is, is right here and why this is quite a profound way of thinking differently about writing programs. When you understand this idea, 
then you'll understand the brilliance of promoting data up to the syntax level of your language. And then why giving a huge toolkit of functions to work with that data um, is the right way to do things. And that's exactly what Clojure does. So let's have a little look at how does data as syntax look like. So here are the four core data structures that Clojure offers. Uh, lists, vectors, maps, and sets. And as you can see, lists have the, the syntax of using parentheses, vectors, square brackets, maps, curly braces, and sets have a hash in front of the curly brace. And you might also notice that there are no commas separating the elements. That's because in Clojure, a comma is treated as white space. So that means it's fully optional if you put it there or not. Uh, most uh, coding standards or guidelines would recommend not to put it for lists, but to use them just as a visual separator when you have key value pairs in maps, as you see here on the third line. So what does this mean when we have data as syntax? It means that we visualize our data, we bring it to the forefront, and it makes it easier to think about, to talk about, to communicate to each other, and to work with. Not only that, but it also makes it easier to construct nested data, which is, of course, the main kind of data that we work with with our systems. Here we have an example uh, vector that contains three maps, and each map contains three key value pairs, and one of those values is a vector itself. And what I want you to notice is how clearly we see the shape of the data, uh, and, and think about how hard it is to see the shape of data when you're using the program, when you're using code to construct rather than syntax. You just don't see it, right? It's, it's lost in the code. I, I think there's a reason why JSON has taken over the world in terms of communicating data. And you can think of Clojure's data syntax as JSON with superpowers. One of those superpowers is that Clojure's code itself is data. So Clojure doesn't stop with making the system data easy to visualize and to reason about and to work with. It takes the perhaps heretical, but uh, I believe inspired next step to represent the code itself as data, as a data structure. Uh, that's because Clojure is a LISP. Uh, LISP, stands, LISP stands for list processor. So you can probably guess which data structure it uses to represent its code. That's right, it uses lists. And here's how a function call is represented as a list enclosure, where the function is always the first element in the list, and the arguments are the rest of the elements in the list. And this is called prefix notation. And what, what's good about it is it simplifies the syntax, because you can, it means that the language is 100% consistent in the order of precedence. There's no book that you need to learn that in this case you put them the operator or the function here, in this other case it goes there, it's always at the front of the list. So let's see some examples of how that looks like. So when we want to add numbers together, you put the function at the front of the list. When we want to find the max of a group of numbers, you put the function at the front of the list, and the arguments follow. And of course you can have as many arguments passed to these as you want. When we're filtering a collection, here we use a predicate function called odd that filters out the odd numbers from the vector. Again, filter goes at the front, and then you pass, uh, in this case, a, um, a function as the first argument. And then when we're doing conditionals, it's the same. If goes at the front, then we have a nested list. That's the, that's the important thing to notice about this piece of code. Uh, so the way it works with Clojure is when you have nested data structures in the code, so nested lists, you always evaluate from the deepest nest, nested list first. So he would evaluate that one is less than two, so it's true, that predicate and therefore we, the, this conditional will return A rather than B. Okay, here's another quote. Nobody wants to program with mutable strings anymore. Why do you want to program with mutable collections? You've probably noticed already that I like quotes. Uh, that's because I think at their best, they have an almost magical ability to distill a lifetime's worth of wisdom and knowledge into a bite-sized piece of clarity. And I think the particular insight with this quote is that Rich is saying, we've already solved how to make our programs stable to build upon. And the answer is building on immutable data. In Enclosure, all the collections are immutable by default. 
And I think this is something that our industry has started to wake up to. Of course, you, you get immutable data structures in most languages now. But where I think Clojure is different is that it did that right from the beginning. It's a core part of the language, and it's not been added as an afterthought or as a library. So that changes how those data structures are and how people code by default in Clojure in a good way. So let's get a feeling for what it's like to work with these immutable collections, starting with strings. So here what we're doing is we're defining a string with the name first name, and we're giving it the value Dave. And as you see, it's in the list, and def is how you define, and that goes first, and then you pass the arguments just as before, so you already understand closure, right? That's kind of cool. And then if we're going to manipulate that string, so in this case, we're concatenating it with another string, I'm sorry. And that outputs, I'm sorry, Dave, as expected. But we haven't changed first name. The value of first name is and always will be Dave. And that's pretty common in most languages. That's, that's how we do strings now. Mutable strings aren't really a thing. But where closure is different is all of the other uh, collections working just the same way. So here's an example where we've constructed a vector with three elements. We've called it ages. It has three integers in the vector. And then we, when we conjoin a new uh, element onto the end, 21, that outputs a vector, but it's a new vector, just like we had a new string. And if we look at what's in ages, it hasn't changed. And that gives us this stable base to build upon. It means that there's not a shifting sand of mutability underneath ev everything that we're building. So what does Rich think the problem with mutability is? So eventually, with mutable objects, you create an intractable mess. And encapsulation does not get rid of that. Encapsulation only means, well, I am in charge of this mess. So what have we learned so far? Closure separates data from functionality. Closure visualizes our data. It brings it to the front. It makes it a first-class citizen when we're working with our code. Closure code itself is data, and closure collections are immutable by default. And all of these four properties combined are normally what people mean when they say that closure is data oriented. What it means is cl closure puts data front and center when we're building our systems, when we're writing our code, when we're talking about it with our uh, fellow developers, and it changes the way you think about building systems and it enables us to build fundamentally simpler solutions. Okay, so that's the basics of Clojure's design philosophy. But before we hop over into the live coding part of this, I wanted to teach you a couple of pieces of syntax just so it's easier for you to follow along if you haven't seen Clojure before. So here we're defining a function called greetings, uh, which takes a single argument called name, and it concatenates it in fr uh, after the, the string hello. And you'll see that this looks very similar to when we were defining values. You define functions in essentially the same way. However, because creating functions is so common uh, when you're writing code, right? Well, that's what we do for the most part when we're writing functional approach. Clojure actually has some syntactic sugar to simplify and shorten and reduce the, the nesting uh, for when we're uh, making our function. So this is the exact same definition, but here we're using def n instead of def. And you can th think about reading that as define function instead of define. So it's def n greetings name, uh, and then the same implementation. So what we've essentially done is, is shortened how much we need to read and understand each time that we define a function. So that's good to know because we'll be defining some functions later. And then using that, you already know the rule, right? You put it in a list. The function call goes first, then you follow it with the arguments, in this case a single argument, and it would output hello Dave. So our custom functions are treated in just the same way as the core functions in the language. One more thing I want to teach you about. I think one of the things that can be a little bit upsetting when you're first reading a Lisp code, and Clojure is no different as it is a Lisp, is when you get uh, quite a lot of uh, nesting going on in the code. So this is has three nested function calls. And how you would read this is, like I said, from the inside out. 
So we'd start by evaluating range 5, which would give us a sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we apply the increment function with map, so we map it across each of the elements in, in the sequence, giving us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we filter using the odd predicate, so only letting the odd numbers through in the end, which gives us the output 1, 3, and 5. But it feels a little bit unnatural, especially when you're getting used to reading code that way. It feels a bit, oh. And I think that's because, in English at least, that's not how we think and read and write. Uh, we tend to read left to right, not right to left. And we tend to read top to bottom. But Clojure has a trick up its sleeve, a trick that is called uh, thread last. And thread last is, is a macro um, that changes the order of the code, essentially, and lets you flip it. And it's an arrow with two heads. You would see it here. It's, this is a ligature version, but it's just a dash with two uh, chevrons. And what happens here is we can put range 5 first. We see the output, like I said, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then that gets piped or threaded into the next function call uh, in the last position. That's why this is thread last. Uh, and then finally, it gets threaded into the filter at the end. And if you haven't seen this before, it might be a bit confusing. But if you've ever used Unix, you might know uh, the pipe when you pipe the output of one command into the input of the next. And that's essentially what we're doing here. It's called thread, but it's essentially the same. And like I said, commas are treated as white space. But the output of executing range 5 gets placed into where those commas are on mapping into the last position and the output of mapping into the last on filter. I hope that makes sense, because we're going to use this quite a bit. Great, one last quote. Systems are dynamic and data-driven. It might be a nice idea to use a language that is also dynamic and data-driven. So I, I want to show you what it feels like. Of course, we're not going to build a whole system, and we're just going to do a bit of uh, noddy examples, really. But it still, hopefully, will give you a feeling of those properties that we talked about, the design philosophy behind Clojure, how does that impact when you're working with code and shaping algorithms? So let's jump over and do that. Let me just flip into mirror mode. Excuse me one second. OK. Live coding, not terrifying at all, right? So let's see if we have the REPL up and running. So we will send plus one, two to the REPL, and we get three back. Should I zoom in a tiny bit more, maybe, just so it's even easier for you guys to see? That hopefully is big enough. And if you're watching on a mobile phone, then I'm afraid you only have yourself to blame. Wait until you get home and watch it on the big screen. OK, so what's happened here? Like I said, it's a list. The first element is the function. Then we pass the arguments, and we're returning three, right? That's nice and simple. But what I'm going to show you in, in this example is uh, some textual analysis. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a book. And we're going to read in a file. And one of my favorite names functions is a function called slurp. I just think it sounds so delicious. And we're going to slurp in a book from the Project Gutenberg. And it's quite a big book, so we'll see how long this takes to load. And what Slurp does is it reads a file, either from the local uh, file system or remotely, as you see here, and it converts it into a string. So we've now set the value of the book symbol to be a string of the book. But if we're going to do some analysis on it, we're going to want to break that out into the words in the book as a separate sequence. There are a couple of ways we could do this. Uh, one way is to use like string functions and split them based on spaces. But in fact, we're going to do a regular expression. There's a function called reseq that does a matching pattern uh, and, and outputs a sequence that matches that regular expression. And I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, but if you have a problem and you solve it with a regular expression, now you have two problems. So that's basically what we're doing here. So what we're going to match it on is word characters or quotes. So anytime we see an A, B, C all the way to Z, or a 0 to 9, or I think underscore. That's a word character, and any quote or apostrophe so that we get possessives. And let's run that across the whole book. Hopefully that will work. OK, and let's count how many words we have. And that might give us an idea about what book we're looking at. 220,391 words. 
if someone knows what the book is just based on the word count, I'll be impressed. But let's take the first 20 of those words, and that might tell us what the title is. So it's Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville. So let's do some analysis on Moby Dick. So the first thing we're going to try and find out are what are the 20 most frequently used words in this book? And we're going to use the thread last macro, the one that I just explained to you what it is and how it works. So hopefully you can follow along. So we're going to take the words. And there's another really useful uh, core function that's called frequencies enclosure. And if we read the text, it's a bit small here, but it says returns a map from distinct items in collection to the number of times they appear, which sounds almost exactly like what we want. So let's run that. That might take a while because it's a big book. So here we've got a map, and it's the, the word and then the, the frequency that it appears in the book. And I already see a problem here because lower is ironically not lowercase, it's uppercase. So what we're probably going to want to do is use uh, closure.string slash lowercase. So this function takes a string and outputs the lowercase version of that string. But of course, with words, we have a sequence of 220,000 strings. So we can't just run this once. We have to map that function across all of the entries in the sequence. Let's see if that fixed our problem with uppercase. Yeah, that looks good. And like I said, uh, when I briefly introduced uh, functions, but th this is what's called a higher order function. So what happens is, uh, as well as functions as well can take data or they can take functions. So this is a higher order one that takes the lower case. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to sort this so that we can figure out which are the most frequently used ones. And if we just do a standard sort, it's going to sort them alphabetically. So we want to give it another uh, function to sort by. And because we had a map, we know we have keys and values. So if we sort by keys, it's going to sort alphabetically. But what we're going to do is sort by the value because the value was the frequency. So hopefully this will give us in order, yes, so these are the, the words that only appear once, and then the last ones of this list should hopefully be the most frequently used ones. So let's take the last, say, 20, because that's what we were aiming for. And here are the 20 most commonly used words in Moby Dick. However, these are very, very boring, because these would be the 20 most commonly used words in most English works, especially at this length. So what we're actually going to do is try and make this a bit more interesting we're going to define a value called common words, and it's going to be the set of common words in the English language. And I had prepared that one earlier, so we paste that in. And here you start to get a feeling for what it's like when you bring uh, the, the data and the data structures up to the front to be first class, because we see the shape of this data, right? OK, so now we have those common words. So what we want to do now is, after we've done the lowercase, we want to remove those words out of the, the collection, common words. So let's run that, and hopefully we'll get a different result. Yes, this looks promising. And what's happening here? Maybe this is interesting. How did it work that we could pass a set into the remove function? So let me just take a quick detour to explain what's happening there. When we have a set, so let's say we have a set that contains 1, 2, and 3, Clojure can treat that as a function itself. So if we say and pass that the argument 1, what it's going to do is return 1 if that's in the set. And if we pass 4, which is not in the set, it will return nil. And in closure, 1 or any value is a truthy value. So that means that if we're filtering or removing on it, it, it will um, exist. And nil is a false or falsey value. So in this case, uh, when the common words are in this list, they get removed. So that's how that works. So let's have one more look at what these were then. OK, so drum roll, the number one used word in uh, Moby Dick is whale, perhaps unsurprisingly. We have ye and Ahab and ship. Oh, thank you. How kind. And sea and man, and perhaps this isn't too surprising. But what I want you to start to see here is just how close the, the solution that I've described is to maybe how you would start to think about describing this to someone else in words if you're doing some kind of pseudocode uh, description of what we're doing. So let's just read it out. So we take the words, 
uh, we map them to lowercase, we remove the common words, we calculate the frequencies, we sort those by the frequency, or the val in this case, and then we take the last 20. And I also want you to notice how much it feels like playing with Lego. What we're doing is just combining different functions that all know how to work on these sequences, these data structures that have this first-class citizenship within Clojure. Uh, and it, it becomes that, that, uh, that act of molding the software. And, and you see how using a REPL gives you this instant feedback as you're working on it. So you spot things as you go, and you can improve and tweak your algorithms as you build them. Great. So let's see how that would be slightly different if instead of doing the 20 most frequently used words, let's find the longest words. And what we probably want to do here to start with is reduce the, the problem space a little bit. So instead of doing this over all 220,000 words, let's find the set of words. So distinct returns a lazy sequence of the elements of the collection with duplicates removed. So that's exactly what we want to do. And then once we have the set or the distinct, then we can sort them by uh, the count. So let me just show you why this is working. So if we uh, use the count function on a string, it's going to return the number of characters in the string. Because internally, you can think of closure as representing a string as a sequence of characters. So when we sort by the count here, it's going to count each one and then sort them by that, which should be exactly what we want. Yeah, so these are all single letter, so let's then take the last 20 of these. And these should be the 20 longest words in the book. Oh, there's some good words here. Supernaturalness, the longest word is uninterpenetratingly. That's a very good word. Uh, and let's do one more thing. So let's see exactly how many characters each one of these have. So we'll use the group by function, and we'll group by the count this time. And that way, what it's going to do is count each of these and then put them in a, in a vector for all of the ones that have that number of characters. So these are all the ones with 16. And we see that the longest word in Moby Dick has 20 letters or 20 characters. Pretty cool. OK, one last little thing that we're going to do then is find the longest palindrome in Moby Dick. So hopefully you all know what a palindrome is. But if you don't, I can teach you now. One of my favorite palindromes is the word race car. So a palindrome is a word that's the same backwards and forwards. So what we're going to do is create a little helper function called palindrome question mark. And this is going to take any collection and return true if it's a palindrome and false if it isn't. So as a palindrome is the, the same thing forwards and backwards, the easiest way to do this in Clojure, I think, is if we compare the collection to the reverse of the collection. Let's execute that and do some tests. Again, the great thing about using a REPL is that we can test as we go. So if we pass in a vector, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, that should be a palindrome. It is. And then let's try with a string. Race car should also be a palindrome. And it isn't. And that's interesting. So why is that not a palindrome? The, the secret here is how the reverse function works with the string enclosure. So if we pass in race car to reverse, what we see is we get a sequence of characters back, not them concatenated together into a string. So when you compare this string to this sequence, Clojure says, uh-uh, those two things aren't the same. However, there's a little trick we can use here. There's a call function called seek, which forces a collection to be uh, turned into a sequence. So what that will do is turn race car, the string, into the sequence of characters. So it will turn that into this. And if it's already a sequence, it won't touch it. So then if we execute this, hopefully this is still true. Now this should be true. And then let's just double check that this works. That isn't a palindrome. So good, this feels like it's working. So let, let's, let's use this then to do some analysis and find the longest palindrome in Moby Dick. So we take the words. Uh, should we do lowercase? No, I don't think it makes any difference this time. But we should do distinct again. Let's. Just care about the oops, the set of words rather than every single word. And then what we're going to do is we're going to filter. Before we did a remove uh, up here, we, so we remove the common words. This time we're going to do the opposite of that. So what filter does is it keeps all of the ones that match uh, 
that match the, the function that you pass in, whereas before, remove got rid of the ones that match, if that makes sense. So hopefully this should give us all of the palindromes in the book. Yeah, these single, of course, single letter words are technically a palindrome, but those aren't really that interesting. And these don't look like they're sorted. So let's sort them by count like we did before. Yep, that looks like it's working. And then let's take the last, say, 10. So these should be the longest palindromes in Moby Dick. Dude is in there, apparently. Poop, we're learning things here. And the longest word is deified. That's a nice word, and I didn't know that that was a palindrome, so that was cool. But we're actually trying to find the longest palindrome, so instead of taking the last 10, we could just take the last one. Or there's also a function that's even simpler than that that's just called last, which will give us the same result. Okay, and what we've been doing here is just creating these. Uh, it's not really a function because we haven't named it. We've not defined anything here. So we can't call these bits of code from anywhere else. So just to show you what it feels like to do that, let's define a function called uh, longest palindrome that takes words. And then we tab this in. Oops, not that one. So it takes the words, finds the distinct set of words in that list of words, filters out the palindromes, sorts them by the count, and grabs the last. Again, get a feeling for how close this is to how we would talk about it, how few characters we're using. I know there are some languages that really try to be extremely terse and really concise. And I think there is a lot of value in that. Of course, if you're getting down to just having you know, characters to describe things, you start to lose some of the clarity. So I think there's probably a balance there between clarity and conciseness. And for my taste, at least, I feel like Clojure gets really close to perfect there. So let's run that. So now we have a custom defined function that we can call longest palindrome. And if we pass in the words there, it should give us the same result, which it does. And because we have a REPL, we can test. So let's just test with a few other words that we know are palindromes. Let's put race car in again, and hopefully it will return race car. And it does. So this was pretty much everything I wanted to show you. Um, like I said, fairly basic functions. You know, we're not building a system here. But again, it's, it's more to give you a feeling for what does it feel like to shape your solutions, to build them as you go with this toolkit, this, uh, this bucket of bricks that you get with Clojure, and with bringing out the data structures to this top level. So hopefully, if you haven't seen this before, you've learned something. Hopefully, even if you'd seen Clojure before, some of the stuff we talked about before about the philosophy was a little bit interesting. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I would gladly answer. No questions? Then hopefully it was either really clear or really confusing. We don't really know. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, there was no question. We had one question. I think it was answered in the following slide, the guy said in the... Oh, perfect. Thing. Yes. So that was really clear. Thank you. You addressed some questions. You raised some thoughts and then you answered them. Well, excellent. <laughs> I think it was excellent. Thank you very much. We'll give you a clap. Thank you very much, James. So next up is uh, Joakim. He's going to talk about the last... The last, now I forgot this, the name of the polylith, the last architecture you will ever need. And I assume it's written in closure. Yes, of course. Ooh, <coughs> good. Welcome on stage. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, so, welcome to this presentation of a software architecture called Polylith. And uh, with the title the last architecture you will ever need. Kind of cool. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, first, some background. Uh, what is Polylith? How to use it? And why you should use it? Uh, and this, this is a city. A code city. And it's made by this guy. And uh, this uh, city is actually the Java Development Kit 1.5. And his project uh, makes it possible to visualize code bases as cities. 
and it's kind of cool. And uh, each building here is a class. And uh, the code base is divided into packages. And the top package here is the Java package. And then we have uh, sub packages uh, in this code base. And uh, in each package, we store um, classes in this case. Uh, but if it's a functional language, we would uh, put uh, functions in there. So this is how we structure code normally. But uh, let's pretend now that this is our own code base, our own project. Then we would have a source folder with a top package. And then we would put our domains in here. And uh, let's say this is uh, the booking domain. And let's say that we, with this domain, we can borrow and lend the tools, maybe between uh, people we know in our neighborhood or and um, let's say that we want to extract this uh, domain into its own service. So how do we do that? Then we, uh, then we need to create a new project, a booking service in this case. Then we add a source folder and we put uh, some top namespaces in there. And, uh, and now we can put our domains inside here. And, uh, we have some more code from the other service we, we need in the new service. For example, lender and, and stuff. And uh, some other code here. And um, the good thing here now is that the booking part of the old service is only used from one place. That means that we can just move this code into the new service. And then we can add some code to expose this uh, service to uh, yeah to the outside wor world and now we can delegate to this new service here let's have some water okay but we have some more code here also that would be nice to just move but uh, unfortunately this code is also used by the old old service so we can't just move it but uh, what can we do Maybe we can just um, copy this code. So let's try that. So we copy this code, and uh, but maybe that's not a good, really good idea, because now we need to maintain the same code from two places. And if we find a bug in one place, we need to update the code, remember to update it in the other place. So and and we kind of fail to reuse those building blocks here. But maybe you can come up with some better solutions here. Uh, what if we create a library of those building blocks? So let's do that. We create a new project with a source folder and a top package. And now we can just move the code into here. So that's great. And if we freeze the code, into a library, we can now use the code from those other two services here. So that's kind of good. And the good thing now is that we can work with uh, all our code from one place now. So we could, uh, so we can get rid of the code the duplication that we had. But uh, what happens with the development experience here? Uh, be because if, if, if you want to make a change now in our first service here, we need to go back to another project, uh, the, the booking library project, edit the code, make some changes, uh, create a new library, and then we can use the code. And the same with the other service here. And um, what's bad with this? Uh, one thing is that the code base now is not in sync, you could say, because we are using different versions of the libraries. And we can't uh, guarantee here that our system systems or our system works with the latest version of the code. But I don't think this is the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem here is that um, uh, it now, now we, we can't just make a little change in, in a service and get instant feedback. 
because now now we what what we need to do now is we we need to switch project and we need to edit the code in this library project uh, build a snapshot and we need to re re reload that code into the service so so before we had instant feedback and now we have a slow feedback loop so it sounds like we could improve here so what if we could uh, grow the code instead so let's say let's what what if we could uh, start a project by adding small building blocks one at a time and kind of grow them one at a time <coughs> and and what if we could work with all the w all our code from one place and get that uh, nice feedback feedback loop that would be really great and what if those what what if we could just continue adding small building blocks to our code base like if it was a garden that would be nice but also what if those building blocks were like lego bricks and and, and if we could do grow the way we run the code also what if we could put those lego like building blocks into one place very easily and then and and if we could do that then then we could grow the way we run our code also like this and that would be fantastic actually and this is actually what polyth is about so what is polyth um, polyth is a software ar architecture mostly for the back end it's simple flexible and it makes you pr productive and it consists of uh, small building blocks and uh, that are easy to uh, combine and compose into uh, services tools and libraries and uh, it also helps you keep your code base consistent because we have only one of each uh, building block so we don't add any any code duplication to our code and it's also very flexible and the way we extend or grow our code base is by adding one component at a time so it's very extendable and uh, it's also rep those uh, building blocks they are replaceable also so they are like lego bricks so very yeah nice to work with uh, it polyeth also makes you productive and uh, and one reason is that uh, you you uh, work with all your code from one place as if it was a single code base and um, while in production uh, it's very easy to change how you uh, work uh, how, how you run the, the code so and so in, in, in your development environment you can work with all your code from one place so you get uh, so you can refactor your code debug your code or navigate your code while in so, so you kind of optimize for productivity while in production uh, you can optimize for uh, non-functional uh, requirements so we separate those two words and this is really core to polyth okay so how uh, does it work um, we have those libraries they are just the libraries you already know nothing uh, magic at all and then you have uh, we have components and what is a component a component is a block of code uh, that has a name and uh, it lives in a directory that has the same name as the component and that director 
has three directories, source, test, and resources. And a component um, has an interface also. And this is not the type of interface you know, because this one has a namespace called interface. And that this uh, namespace or package or module, what you call it, has a set of functions, and this is the only thing that this component exposes to other components. And then we have one or several um, namespaces that implements the functionality. And you put functions here, too. And you can structure your code in any way you want here. And uh, the functions in the interface, uh, what they do is that each function delegates to a function in the, in the implementing code here. So it's just a one-liner that delegates the call. Uh, components are also very flexible. And um, we, we, we put all the components in, 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 in a system in a directory called components. So here we have one component uh, so far. And when we extend the code base, we, 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 just, uh, we add uh, one more directory to this or component to this directory. So that's how we extend it. And um, we can also extend the, each component by adding more um, namespaces, uh, in implement, implementing namespaces to this component. Um, components, uh, we, we said that they are replaceable also. And how that works is that if we add one more component here, uh, Invoicer2, it's a really great name, um, and if that um, uh, component uh, has, uh, uses the same um, interface with the same set of functions, as in this case, then if we uh, have a project, it could be a service, for example, that uses Invoicer, then we can uh, just replace that component with Invoicer2 in this case, without the surrounding code uh, noticing any difference. So that's where we get this uh, Lego-like um, uh, feeling of working with Polylith. We have one more uh, building block, and that's a base. So what is a base? A base is very similar to a component. It's just um, a piece block of code, you can say. Uh, it has a name, a good name, hopefully, and it lives in a directory with the with the same name as the base. And it has uh, three directories: source, test, and resources. And it lives in a namespace with the same name as the base. And uh, what's special with the uh, bases are that they expose a public API. And that could be something like uh, a REST API, Lambda function, or uh, uh, a, a tool. Uh, so, so in this case, we, we, we just expose a main function here. And they are also flexible. And, and the way we um, extend uh, a base is by delegating to components. And we don't put uh, business logic into a base. We only just delegate uh, to other components. So a, a base is a very thin layer, you could say, that exposes a public API, and it, and it just delegates to components. So they are very simple. And uh, I said that uh, Polis makes you productive also. How does that work? Yeah, we, we have the, this single development environment. And um, here we have three libraries, two bases, and five components. And the way it works is that we have a single um, configuration file where we specify all our libraries that we uh, use. And then each component and base also has its own source folder specified in that file. And that's everything that is needed, actually, to be able to work with all your code as if it was a single code base, just a single file. 
And then in production, it looks exactly the same. Uh, the only difference here is that uh, in, in development, we have only one, uh, one uh, project. But in production, we, we can have more than one project. And, and, and what we do with the, those is that we produce artifacts from them. And, and this, this artifact could be, for example, a service. Let's say this is a REST service. Then this blue box here, this uh, is, is the base. And this is where we put um, the REST related stuff. And what it does is that it delegates to the component components that implements the functionality and uh, uses libraries also. So it's very simple, but very flexible and powerful. And the last thing here, maybe I should have some water. Is why? So why why should we use Polylith? I think we have a number of challenges today in this software industry that is not really solved or yeah. So one challenge is that sharing code is is hard. And um, we try sometimes we sometimes we duplicate code, and sometimes we try to solve that by creating libraries for code that we actually work quite a lot with, and both of them have doesn't solve the problem in a, in a good way. But with Polylith, sharing code is easy because we just have a set of uh, building blocks that we just can use e everywhere. It's very easy and simple. Um, a growing software is hard today. And I think the main uh, problem is that we put code into places. For example, this could be a service. And it doesn't matter how big or small the service is. We have the, this problem is the same. So if we we have a service and realized, oh, it would be nice to, to take this little piece of functionality and use it here. We can't do that because everything is kind of glued into uh, one place. So, but with Polylith, it's easy uh, to grow software uh, because we just add one uh, building block at a time. And then when we then we and, and then we just combine them when we know how we how know the way we want to execute it in production. Um, oh shit! I can now. I need my glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, another problem here is that we don't have a shared language for talking about software architecture today. And um, but with Polylith, we have a shared language, and uh, because we have those new concepts, or components, and uh, bases and projects, uh, that makes it easy to uh, to reason about software. So the components we know they just expose a set of functions, so they are easy to reason about, and the bases exposes uh, public APIs. And projects, they are just a set of those spinning blocks with, by using just one single file. So when you come as a new developer to a Polylith code base, it's very easy because we have those concepts at, as directories in the, works, in, in, in the workspace, which means that uh, if you want to have an idea of what this code base can do, you can just expand the components directory and just read because each component will tell you what what it what it what it what it does. And if you expand the um, projects directory, uh, you can see okay, this is the artifacts that we build uh, here, and and it could be a number of services or even tools and, and stuff. So it's very simple. Um, and uh, I want to say one more thing, yes. Um, it also changes the way you think about software. 
and and you don't um, one thing is that you don't start by thinking how should this be executed in production but also you don't divide things into layers so you in polyth we we, we don't uh, have like two three four five layers or, or whatever we just create those components and then uh, when uh, when uh, it's time to um, decide how to execute it in production we just uh, put them together into a project so that uh, changes uh, how you think about software and, and 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 it makes things so much easier uh, and another problem today is that collaborating on code is hard but with polyth uh, that's easy uh, it's very common today that you work in teams and each team is responsible for one or several services but they uh, each team work in their own code bases or projects so they we, we don't share code and so on but with Polyth, uh, we have one place for all our building blocks and all teams uh, work in the same uh, uh, place, you could say. So, and, and, e and, and different teams can, can share the same components between services and teams. And uh, sometimes it happens that uh, one team, of course, can have one component that only they use, but all components are um, it's possible to use them everywhere anyway, no restrictions. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, today, another problem is that code is uh, o organized for ease of uh, deployment instead of ease of development. So, what we do today is that we we create our uh, services, for example. So here we have two services in production. And uh, that's, that's our starting point. How should this be executed in production? And then we end up with uh, two projects to work with in our development environment also. And if we add one more service in production, it, we will end up with one more in, in our development environment. So um it kind of our development experience gets worse and worse or it's it gets harder over time but with polylith we 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 we, we not just organize code for um, ease of deployment but also ease of development because we 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 separate those two concepts and in production, we can uh, add or change how we run the code. And it will not affect how you work with the code. So that's really, really good, really nice. And uh, yeah, so that's one of the core ideas here. here. And finally, I want to say a little bit that tests take long time to run today. But with Polylith, tests run fast. And the reason is that, so, so how it works is that if you ch ch make a change in a one component, you only have to execute the tests in that component and uh, the projects that are affected by that change. And this uh, um, kind of encourage you to run the tests often locally, which is good. And uh, and the same thing happens in production in 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 your continuous integration server that the tests the, the the time it takes to run all the tests or actually it doesn't run all the tests it only runs the tests it needs but the it speeds up the um, feedback loop everywhere so to summarize keep it simple. Use small Lego-like building blocks that you can combine easily. 
work fast from a single development environment that gives a really fast feedback loop. And have fun because playing with Lego is super fun. I can really recommend it. And who made this? Uh, it was me and James that you have seen already, and Ferk, and that will come after me. Thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have any questions yet, but thank you very much, you are Kim. We get a small applause here from the people in the. So next up, who's gonna not just go through the concepts and theories is Firkin, who will actually show yeah. actual polylith. Yeah, thank, thank you, you and welcome. Thank you. Thank the you stage very much. is yours. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, I'm gonna show you a real-world example of polylith. So my name is Furkan, and I'm one of the com contributors to the polylith project that Joachim just explained. And I'm also a co-founder co of a startup called Scrental. And I will show you how we use Polit in the real wo world by walking you through Scrintle's software development process in its early days. So let's start. So I will start with quickly explaining what Scrintle is. Scrintle is a new generation uh, data analysis platform with automated transcription, mainly targeting academic researchers. Users can upload audio or video files and get an automated transcript. Later, they can edit analyze or um, change their transcripts on live collaborative text editor like Google Docs. The backend is written with Clojure and it uses a database called Datomic Cloud. And of course, it's a true Polit project from the beginning. You can say I'm a little bit biased towards Polit. However, this is not the only reason that I chose to adopt it at Scrintle. Polit idea perfectly fits to a startup or a fast moving company. It helps you to keep your code base lean and makes it easy to pro do product iterations. It makes your life easier as a de developer. So let's quickly look at how the overall arch architecture looks like. Scrintle is a web application and the end users access it through their web browsers. The front end is a single page React application written in TypeScript and hosted on AWS. And it communicates to the back end via a REST API. And the collaborative text editor's backend is hosted on Google's Firebase. And the application's backend and REST API is hosted on AWS. We use Amazon's transcribe service and Google's speech API to provide automated transcriptions. So when we came up with the idea, we knew that there was a need in the industry. First thing we needed to do was to make sure our solution is doable. In order to validate the idea, we started by creating an empty Polit workspace. The next thing was adding some small components to validate the idea. For example, we created components to store and retrieve files from Amazon's S3 and Google's storage. Also added some more components to transcode, transcribe, and generate text documents out of the audio files. These components let us simulate the functionality needed on our local machines. We were able to transfer files to cloud, start transcription operations on different providers to test their services and parse the resulting transcript into a human readable version. And there was nothing to deploy yet at this moment. And we were just working on a single local REPL. Once we proved the idea and it was doable, we started growing the Polit workspace by turning it into a real backend service. We decided to expose our functionality via a REST API. And in order to do that, we needed to grow the workspace with a base that handles requests and responses to the backend. Our new base is called REST API. The REST API is taking care of incoming requests, calling functions from other necessary components, and preparing the res response. This base exposed our REST API to the other world via Amazon's API Gateway. And it was time to deploy the very first version of Scrintle's backend. In order to deploy our code, we needed a deployable artifact. As Yoki mentioned uh, previously, artifacts in a Polit workspace are created through a project. We called our project backend. A Polit project is a simple configuration file that defines which components and base and libraries should be included in that artifact. As you can see, at this stage, we have only one deployable artifact, which includes all the components and the base. 
You can, of course, have extra components in your workspace that are not included in any artifact. After a couple of weeks running our system, it was time to optimize it a little bit. At some point, we hit into some performance problems. Some big file transfers from our backend to Google Storage was blocking the server resources, so which, which was increasing the response times of our API. We decided to split the file transfer logic into a separate Lambda function. And in order to do that, we extracted the file transfer logic into its own component. We also added a new base to expose the service as a Lambda function. So essentially, this base was exposing a function which became the entry point for the Lambda function. Once that Lambda function is called, the base is passing the call to the GCP transfer component and returning the result of that transfer. Once everything is ready and tested locally, it was again the time to deploy the new Lambda function. We already had the backend project in our workspace from before. We created a new project called GCP transfer and included the necessary components and the new base. Once the project configuration was ready, we deployed our two artifacts separately, one of them as a server and the other one as a Lambda function. As you can see here, all of the components and bases live in the same Polit workspace. We pick components and bases when the need arises and then package them in projects and create artifacts. And if you noticed here, the logger and GCP storage components are shared between two projects. So the components themselves live in the Polit workspace, in other words, in one place, but they are referenced by different projects. So if you change any of those shared components, the changes will be reflected automatically in any project that they, they are referenced from. So it's been over a year since the first commit to Scrintel's repository. And so far, we have four Polit projects, 49 components, four bases in the whole workspace. And three of those projects are uh, deployed as Lambda functions. And one of them is deployed as a server, and that exposes our REST API. And here you can see that like different components are used in different projects and shared between different projects. So. Now, let me summarize our experience with Polit at Scrintel. So Polit, together with Clojure, let us focus on our product and business logic, rather than thinking about how we are going to deploy them. This is a really great luxury for a fast-moving startup. We spend less time to get a code base that has, one might say, the best architecture following the best practices. It also helps us reduce the amount of meetings we take for architectural decisions. Even in those meetings, Polit provides a common language to communicate within the team about our code base, and it helps us get rid of a lot of friction. With using Polit, we were able to move really quick. We were adding new features, like combining some Lego bricks. Also, the architecture helped us pivot our ideas along the way. If a component is not working, it's easy to replace it with another component, as long as its interface is the same the other components won't be affected. And finally, working from a single workspace with a single REPL is a great experience for a developer. It increases our productivity both during development and also during the day-to-day -day customer support. For example, if we receive a customer request, what we do is we just run a local REPL and access the whole backend functionality within seconds. So. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I would really like recommend you to adopt Polit in your projects. I can assure you that you won't regret that decision. And I hope, uh, I hope you, you do that. So if you have any questions, now is the time. So you can shoot, to, shoot them to me, either me or Yoki or James. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have any questions right now. Okay. From the p any questions? I but uh, however, I have one question. Yeah, sure. How come you started the Polylith project? I mean, what was the? How did we start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, uh, James and Furkan worked together at that time, and I uh, they have in 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 a project. And they, you have been doing that for a few months, yeah. maybe. 
Yeah. Okay. And then I started there, and they already had uh, microservices. Uh, they have just started. Yeah, they have um, had a microservices solution. And then um, we kind of. I thought it was kind of complicated. It was over complicated. I felt so. I said so. I suggested to use libraries mm. instead. So each instead of a few services, we had uh, a few libraries and one kind of main project that hosted those uh, libraries. And then uh, the, um, we we got that um, slow feedback loop when working with libraries when working with the code. It was kind of not living code; it was frozen code, and we didn't like that. And then I came up with the f my first idea was to use symbolic links. That was the old Polyth version that we re released two years ago. And but now we have um, now we build on tools.deps, yeah. which uses a single configuration file to solve the same problem. So mm. yeah. So basically, the the main problem that made Polyth um, alive was the like we wanted to isolate things, but we didn't want to isolate them in the deployment we just wanted to isolate them when we are developing so that's that's why uh, we found this problem and then we got rid of the microservices and adopted pull that idea yes then we have one more question from david Bujik. components and versions can read it out there yeah question is components and versions question mark yeah, you can. What you can do, I mean, um, uh, Polyth, the Polyth workspace where all building blocks lives, um, is a single, uh, is a mono repo. But what you can do is that you can. Uh, b uh, this interface can be actually split into sub namespaces. So, so we have this interf uh, the, the package or namespace called interface. You can uh, have interface dot, and then you can have sub namespaces in there and if you what you can do is you can put one that is called uh, v2 or version 2 or something if you want so you can split up the interface in versions in, in that way if you want and then yeah so that, that that's one way of sol solving it and and uh, and if you like uh, working in short Living branches also. This is also a good idea because now you have all all your code in one single monorepo. So that's if you like that way of working, it also simplifies that too. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like versioning can be achieved by creating a new version of the same component. Also, like yeah, if absolutely. You if you want to uh, get rid of the old one and then introduce a new one, you can just implement the same interface and then start working on that. Once it's ready, switch that in the in the deployed artifacts which to the new version of the component mm. exactly mm. okay thank you very much so a big applause here for you Joachim and Furkin yeah okay, thank, thank you, you. Yay. Woo. Woo. The yes the audience okay. uh, so our last and final presentation we'll have an introduction and what rust borrowed um from uh, thank you. functional languages by Emil. Thank you very much. Yes, I will get you the, oh, the little the back. You are Kim, you have to come back with the HDMI adapter. <laughs> <laughs> no, the adapter. No. Yeah. There's always something with this something. video links. Yeah. So welcome up on stage. And I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm here to speak about what, what Rust borrowed. So, before we begin briefly about myself, I'm Emil. I'm an engineer at Amazon Web Services. Um, I've been working primarily in Rust for the um, past two years, since um, the fall of 2018, initially at Imperva, and uh, as of this fall at AWS. I was delighted when I got to AWS to see the extent that we're already using Rust internally. I also like flags for some 
odd reason. I'm not sure how that actually happened. Here's my favorite flag. This is Kamchatka Oblast in, in Russia. Let's just take a moment to appreciate that flag. Yeah, all right. Um, so in this talk, um, Rust is a very neat, highly hyped systems programming language. So what has systems programming got to do with functional programming? Aren't those at opposite ends of the programming language continuum? Well, not exactly. I probably don't need to tell this audience that there's a lot of great ideas in functional programming, and a lot of those have been creeping into the mainstream over the past 10, 20, 20 years. Rust takes this further than most languages, though, to the point where I sometimes think of it as the unholy love child of C and Haskell. I'm going to take you through a worked example with an emphasis on the functional elements in, in Rust in an attempt to convince you that Rust is a good language for functional programmers. Um, the example as such is pretty involved. The point of it is not necessarily that you need to get all of this particular example. It's a bit flimsy and mostly there to demonstrate a bunch of features. To assist me, I've got grumpy Joe McCarthy of Lisp fame. He's normally a nice guy, but he's a bit ill-tempered today. Might be because he's been dead for nine years and I brought him back to, for a lousy talk about Rust. Um, so before we dive in, uh, let's speak about what functional programming means in a highly subjective way. I believe that the core of it is that your go-to for how you structure uh, things is around composing functions, much like our earlier speakers mentioned. And that you most work mostly with the mutable data that is successively transformed in the flow of your program. You usually get to model your data using something like algebraic data types. You benefit from a reasonably powerful type system uh, usually with type inference and um, powerful generic support. Although, of course, there are dynamic functional programming languages, as we have seen. Um, admittedly, this isn't a very complete definition of functional programming, though. In fact, I largely picked it to suit my agenda. What are some uh, salient details about Rustin? Well, first off, it has first-class functions. It has algebraic data types. It encourages immutability. In fact, the borrow checker in Rust sometimes forces you to it. And finally, it has a really nice and powerful type system. Uh, the borrow checker in particular has certain implications that drives us towards functional thinking. The fact that you can't, in Rust, have mutable access to something in multiple different locations uh, kind of encourages a functional way of thinking about things. So let's say we want to draw some flags, as one does. It's of course not the case that all flags consist of simple rectangular geometry. Looking at Unipol and Ohio. But nonetheless, a lot of flags can be drawn using simple rectangles. So let's explore that for a bit. Don't worry, Joe, it will be fun. Of the functional programming, languages that are just now entering the mainstream. One, the one that has got me the most excited is probably some types. For people unfamiliar with the concept, a sum type is essentially an enum or 
a tagged union that can hold data. It's not a hugely useful concept in its own right, but coupled with pattern matching, it's a killer. In this particular example, we have a simple data type called shape with a variant circle and rectangle. And the key takeaway here is that circle has a, an integer parameter corresponding to the radius, while the rectangle variant has two integer parameters corresponding to width and height. Um, and here's pattern matching. Uh, key well-known feature to uh, Haskell developers and uh, also available in some form in most, most pro uh, functional programming languages. In Rust, we do this using the match statement. So I enumerate my, enum enumerate my variants, circle and rectangle, specify the variables I want to bind these to. And this is really nice because it allows me to handle these variants in a completely, completely safe way. The language actively prevents me from misinterpreting my, my data. So we can split flags up recursively into a tree structure of one colored strips. Splits can be either horizontal or vertical. We arbitrarily subdivide each such strip at, uh, at a point, a pivot point, the deferred parameter in this horizontal and vertical. And we kind of pick by convention that we'll divide this into parts of 100. Um, so generally, I think this snippet is probably uh, straightforward. The one odd thing here for non-Rust users may be this concept of box, which just means that um, this is going to be, these parameters are going to be heap allocated, which is required since the, the size of a recursive type can't be calculated if it contains itself. Yeah, that's true, Joe. Let's think about what this would look like in Java. Um, the key thing about the alternative approaches, the conventional approaches, that it leaves more room to error in this. We would have to have fields for each of these different things that goes into the endum, and that leaves us with the possibility of having invalid states. What does it mean if we have a horizontal strip that only has one child rather than two? We could deal with that, but we would have to add extra conditional logic to our program, so it makes it less clean and more error prone. So in order to draw a flag, we'll descend the geometry tree and subdivi subdivide the drawing area as we go. To make it easier for callers, because of course we want a nice API design around our flag drawing library. Uh, there is a small convenience method. So the consumers of this API call the draw function, which delegates to the draw area, feeding it the starting x and y coordinates and the full width and height of the of the drawing area. This impl block right here is how we define methods in Rust, how we attach a function to, to a struct or an enum. The first thing we do is that we, in this draw area method, is that we deconstruct self, uh, which is one of these flag geometry enums. And we handle the case of solids, which is an area of one particular color. And all we have to do here is that we visit every single pixel and set it to the color of that particular geometry. We handle the horizontal and vertical strips by subdividing uh, the input uh, the input coordinate and the input dimensions according to the specification. Um, 
calculate the width based on the pivot and the, and the input width. Uh, for the first parameter, for the second parameter, we just offset it by that. The code for the vertical variant is fully analogous to this, so we don't need to go into that in, in detail. Yeah, definitely. Some types and pattern matching make this type of thing really convenient. Notice that we didn't keep any state except for our drawing buffer. And now we try it. We can construct some geometry by hand by nesting flag geometry calls. And then we run our code. Vivler France. That way of constructing flag geometry wasn't great, though. Right yard, yo. Right yard. We need the DSL. Introducing the flag definition language. Our language is, of course, based on S expressions. It includes three functions. S for a solid area, V for a vertical splits, and H for horizontal splits. So how do we, do we define this in Rust? Well, we use a sum type, of course. In this case, we only need two variants, a list, which is just a vector over other S expressions, and a literal, which is some specific string. To make it easier later on, we'll define some helper methods for retrieving a list and literal. Both of these works only for one of the, of the variants. And a safe Rust doesn't have a concept of null. We'll need to use the option type. The option type is in these days widespread enough that even Java has it. In Rust, it's an enum with a variance sum that takes a single value and none which, takes, which doesn't take any value exactly as in Haskell, as it happens. Our parser takes an iterator as a parameter, in this case a special version of an iterator that allows us to peek one character ahead. It inspects all shares, matching them as it goes. The peek and next method both returns an option of a value, as long as it returns sum there is more data to be read. We don't need to understand all the details of this parser, but a few things are worth pointing out. The first is that we only need a single state value, because an option over, an S over our S expression in them is rich enough to represent all the par parser states. For instance, these non-branches are hit when coming in fresh and haven't yet decided whether to parse a list or literal. Then there are the two cases that handles list building. The key is of that we can recurse whenever we need to create a new nested S expression. In that way we can keep our local state very simple and only need to manipulate state locally. Finally, there are two cases for handling literals. All in all, a reasonably compact little parser. I code golfed this a bit to get it to fit on the slide. And a combination of some types, pattern matching and recursion, and recursion really simplified the things a great deal compared to the imperative style. The remaining thing is that we need to transform our S expressions or the tree of S expressions into a flag geometry tree, the original enum that we introduced for drawing. We'll of course do this recursively as well. Rust also supports something called slice patterns, so we can match for lists of certain sizes. Here we look for solid blocks of a single color at this sequences of two instructions th where the first is uh, the literal S. 
We only have one, one other case to handle here for vertical and horizontal blocks. Those S expressions has four parameters that we need to deconstruct. The question mark operator that we see in some places here are for error handling and on packs and options for us, short circuiting the function call and returning none if it ever encounters a missing value. So it makes error handling very convenient. Throughout this presentation, I'm using option everywhere in a real world program. You would probably be using a result instead, which allows you to provide more context about failures. Um, the error handling experience is still much the same now. Now we just have to tie all of this together. We'll pass the flag definition language through a command line argument. The args function here returns an iterator on which we can call the nth method to fetch the first argument. That method actually returns an option of a string. And our s ex expression parse method and two flag geometry method also returns options, so we can just chain them together. Rust doesn't have proper monads, but a lot of things follow a monadic pattern where you can chain them together like this. In addition to option, there is result, which is like Haskell's either iterator as a flash a flat map method. And in asynchronous Rust, Futures also has an and then method and so forth. This pattern helps simplify control flow greatly, and, but without proper monads, you can't abstract over monadic types. So you currently can't write a function that operates on either an option or a result, for instance. All right, so now we can try our FDL parser. And it works. I know, that's one great flag. One of the things that we glossed over earlier was around how we handle colors. In our parser, this is where we turn our single letter color code into our um, color type. But how does this actually work? Parse is a standard method on the string type. This is the definition. Notably, this function takes a generic parameter f with a requirement that f must implement the fromstr trait. What's a trait? Yeah, that's a good question. At first glance, a trait is like a Java interface. Here we implement the standard from straight trait on our color type, and based on that we can magically parse strings into colors. Oftentimes, as in our case earlier, Rust can just infer in the desired type. But um, traits are actually much more powerful than interfaces. For instance, say that we want to abstract the drawing library. We'll define a new tra trait, MSPaint, which defines a way of retrieving the dimensions of the image buffer, as well as a way of drawing a rectangle. And we can now implement that trait over the RGB image type from our image library. That's something you can't do with OOP style interfaces. You can't define and implement your own interface on somebody else's type. Well, maybe in Golang. Um, as a side note, we handle the name clash of width and height here by directly passing self as a parameter to the methods on RGB image. This lays bare what you may have suspected, which is that Rust methods are really only functions with a syntactic sugar, much like Python, really. 
So now we can make our flag geometry independent of the drawing library by just abstracting over MS Paint, saying that any P that happens to be MS Paint will do. Yeah, you may have seen this elsewhere, Joe. Rust traits are pretty much Haskell type classes. The heritage is clear. For instance, consider that equality is handled by the EQ trait in Rust and the EQ type class in Haskell. And the ordering essentially Java's comparable is handled by ORD in both languages. But uh, Rust finally decided to make a strong statement of independence and decided to name the string formatting trait display rather than show. Take that, Haskell. All right, so where do we go from here? Denmark, apparently. Say we want to draw a Nordic flag. It's rectangular enough, so that's good. But we end up having to repeat the exact same definition for the upper and lower part of the flag. Wouldn't it be nice if we could add some type of reference so we can avoid that repetition? Yeah, that's what the results are for, right? So here I've introduced t for the t for tag function and r for reference function, so we can eliminate that repetition. So how, thinking about it, would we implement that? It's not conceptually very hard. We just need to resolve the reference in some way. We could extend our flag geometry and then with two new variants and resolve it as we draw. But that would make drawing stateful and more significantly fallible. We could add another function for resolving a geometry tree, but if we ex accidentally draw something without resolving it first, uh, the drawing would still fail. And resolving references during parsing is also messy. In the end, we always want to strive to make invalid states uh, unrepresentable, especially in the critical phase of the uh, program. Remember kids, fail early, fail fast. So our original flag geometry enum remains unchanged. We introduced this new enum, which has a tag and reference variant and also the methods needed to perform the transformation. And now we just need to add another step to our parser chain, and it all neatly comes together. Yeah, agreed. Java's optional type supports the same type of combinator, and Java's stream API is much like Rust's iterator. So this style of programming is by no means unique to Rust, but it's arguably nicer and more natural combined with some types and traits, and certainly more typical of idiomatic Rust than of uh, idiomatic Java. Um, all right, so to summarize, Rust might, at first sight, look much like a C derivative, but in practice it draws a lot on uh, various functional programming language, it's like Haskell and OCaml. In fact, the original Rust compiler was implemented in OCaml. Hence it follows naturally that it's oftentimes beneficial with a functional approach. Even if you happen to prefer an imperative style within your functions. You can organize your program according to a functional philosophy. Functions can be pure and small, uh, which makes your program easier to reason about and um, easier to test. Abstractions can be based on functional, 
function level polymorphism and par parametric polymorphism. Um, well, Rust does support OOP style uh, trait objects with dynamic dispatch. It's generally not the go-to solution for for most problems. And that's all I've got. Did we get any questions? Or maybe remarks? No question or remarks so far. Um, however, I have a question. Sure. You referenced Haskell quite a lot. Have you ever programmed Haskell? Or have you just... Um, a little bit, but I'm definitely not a, a very good Haskell programmer. Yep. Did you, before you worked with Rust, where did you come from? Java, C++, or...? Um, well, my main background is in uh, more classic languages, so I've kind of come to appreciate functional programming as it's uh, leaped uh, into the into the mainstream, and then mm -hmm. I've been reading more and more about it as um, it's become an ever more relevant topic. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. I don't see any further questions, so then I would like I to. Question. Yes. Why did you pick S expressions for the DSL? Well, uh, yeah. Why did you pick S expressions for the DSL? Well, at the previous job of mine, we had a proud tradition to create bastardized uh, Lisp dialects. Uh, I think we had three of them by the time I left. Uh, so I guess uh, I have a bit of a tradition of doing ill to Lisp syntax. Uh, I apologi apologize to you, Clo Clojure guys. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Emil. Thank you. Nice presentation. <laughs> and thank you to everyone that watched. Um, Punk Prog Sweden, the fifth and last for this year, so we'll come back next year. I'll do a plan with the other guys and we'll come back. And if you want to speak <laughs> or present uh, and get your presentation recorded and published on YouTube and live stream and become a YouTuber like the next generation will be, this is the place. So please contact me and we'll put you on stage. Thank you very much, everyone.